first weekend of June. I know it's the summer, but I talked him out of Memorial Weekend. Our friends, Don and Nancy White, will be here with us. I, I, what I was saying that you couldn't hear was that we've known them since 1993. When we met Don, he was getting a PhD in biology from Montana State University and has been now for the last, I don't even know, a couple decades, I think. I think the chair of the forestry department at the University of Arkansas in Monticello. And uh, he is a passionate six-day creationist, and he will be with us on June, is it June 3rd or 4th? It's, it's the first Sunday in June. I think that's June 4th. And uh, he will be with us. All, we're going to do Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. We will all combine. And he is going to tackle the top three questions he has asked about evolution. And so if you want to hear from a legit authority, a man who knows his biological stuff, a man who can talk about this sort of thing the way I talk about fly fishing, uh, you will enjoy Don. He's been a dear friend of ours uh, for many years. And he loves this church just because we're here. He'll love it even more once he meets you people. That first week in June, sort of, sort of circle it off. That's our first vacation Bible college moment uh, where we will have Don White, PhD, with us, chairman of the forestry department, the University of Arkansas, Monticello, and he'll be talking about, he'll be talking about creation and evolution, the three biggest questions he's always asked. So let's start with our catechism today. How's that? When we get to this question here, question 17, I'll read the question. You read the answer with me. What is idolatry? Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator for our hope and happiness, significance, and security. If I were to boil up much of the problem in the world and in churches today, I don't think I would have called it idolatry but I think I would have slapped that label on it. I encourage you to take a look at these things. That's why we put them in the bulletin throughout the week to consider them. The idea of looking for the things we seek most in things that cannot ever give them. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But let's read the scripture together. It's Romans 1, 21 and 25. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever, amen. An appropriate verse, we talk about the notion of creation and evolution and so on and so forth. That's a good stuff that we have for us this morning in that catechism. Again, encourage you to take a look at it through the week uh, and be reminded of it. It will probably help change direction in a few ways. So here we are, back in Acts 24, I said last week in this, uh, in this series, The Trouble with the Resurrection. Oh yeah, by the way, we'll be back in June tonight. I always forget I got that in there, but we'll be back in the study of Jude uh, and how things have been changing in the landscape of Christianity uh, and how it's been going on for a very, very long time. We'll talk about that tonight. This morning, The Trouble with the Resurrection. I said I had two last week. I might have one more after this, I don't know. But uh, this one sort of arose out of nowhere. You can ask Cheryl, we, we I about drove her crazy this morning in trying to finish something that should have been finished uh, a while ago, but uh, was it just simply because I, I, she said, what took you so long this morning? I said, call it the spirit moving me. I can blame the spirit for anything, amen? Uh, about moving me and everything else. But we talked about Paul before Felix, and I'm just going to read a verse or two, and we're going to jump right into it, because I actually do have a lot of stuff here. Uh, I'll probably skip through some of it, but let's just go back to what we're, where we were. It says that Paul was before Felix in Acts 24, and verse 24 says this, After certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. We were there last week and we talked about Felix. I think if you were here, you'll remember. But suffice it to say that we went through a, a little bit of Felix's resume and about how he was a very evil man, a very cruel man who denied himself nothing and who acquired the things that he wanted uh, through criminality, uh, through deceit, and just outright thievery. Uh, in fact, we said last week that he was so cruel uh, that he was actually replaced by the Romans for being uh, too brutal toward Jews who had participated in a rebellion in Jerusalem. And so he was replaced. So he was not a pleasant fellow. 
And we talked about this, this little exchange that he has with Paul last week. And we talked about Felix basically being a man in search of something. A man maybe secure in something. But trying to acquire the things that so many people wish for uh, through means that never profit. We talked about how he had murdered his, first, his wife's uh, former husband. Uh, and, a, and, and accepted bribes from prisoners whose lives he held in their hand and all sorts of things. Uh, a man who was evidently into accumulating and a man who never seemed to have enough. Uh, and then we talked about Paul's argument before him. Uh, and so we, we talked about all that. We're going to revisit basically the whole thing but from a different, different little perspective. This morning, from the same facts, consider how Felix is not just a man in search of something he can't find, uh, but also that he was, to Paul, invincible. I put here several words, but invincible is the first one. Insurmountable. Felix represented an obstacle to Paul's freedom that he simply couldn't avoid. In that sense, he was inevitable. I got those three I words, right? They seem to sum it up. Invincible, insurmountable, and inevitable. Yeah, you couldn't vanquish him. Paul had no chance to vanquish Felix. You know, whether it's physically or whether it's, it's, it's logically, there was nothing he could say, nothing he could do. Insurmountable in that he just couldn't get around it. I mean, there was just the, the path to his freedom and even the path to remaining alive ran straight through Felix and there was no way around it. Nobody to appeal to. There was no civil rights uh, that was going on at the time, of course, and it was a much different situation. And the idea of inevitable simply means that he simply couldn't be avoided. I mean, if, you, if Paul wanted to be free, if Paul was going to have a future, he couldn't avoid standing before Felix. He couldn't avoid uh, the consequences, if you will, uh, of Felix's judgment. And he stands there, I think. He stands before a man who wishes and seeks his own enrichment, typically at the expense of the helpless. He stands before a man who is not interested at all in justice and who has never heard the term cruel and unusual. Felix answers to no one. We've never experienced that before. I mean, you know, as Americans, right? We've never experienced that before of, of having nowhere to appeal being even denied building permits, right, from the county commissioners, right? Being denied that, so, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't bring that up in here, poor Kevin. Being denied building permits or anything else. There's always some place to appeal, it seems. You can always call a lawyer, right? You get, you, you're convicted in a court of law. There's always some place to appeal. There's always another court. There's always a sense where if we're denied justice now, we will eventually find it. Well, strike that notion from your head. Because Paul has nowhere to appeal. This inevitability runs through a man who answers to no one and, and who will... There is no appeal to, or there is, but you can certainly get lost in the bowels of the dungeons below his feet. How likely do you think it is? Just think about it for a second. How likely do you think it is as Paul stands here? How likely do you think it is of convincing Felix to grant him mercy or of preaching Felix into repentance? I mean, is that your first thought of preaching Felix into a repentance if he stands there judging you or over you or, or, or that insurmountable obstacle to your freedom or to your life itself? How, how confident would you be of talking him into just common compassion or even common sense to, to check his ego and to check his avarice at the door and to consider your plight and the injustice of it all? If you're Paul, you're standing there and you have zero hope of that. I mean, just in, the, in, in, in human terms, there is no hope of that whatsoever. He's been pulled up and out of a dungeon to stand before a despot, a man who sees human life as nothing more than means to an end. And there is no chance of talking or appealing. And I thought about this whole thing this last two weeks. I thought about it before last Sunday. I was thinking about it. And I thought about how, how Felix, acting at Felix in this situation relates to us. Because I think about Felix, and I think about answering to no one. And I think about the impossibility of changing him to hear Paul's plight and to really give an open hearing to it. And I thought that Felix is an apt picture of our world today. 
hear me out, because this is more like an essay than a sermon, but nevertheless, it's more like the world today and really our society in particular. Our society in particular. I don't care where you go, you hear somebody talking about the latest nonsense in our society, don't you? And sometimes it comes from us. We pass through the living room and we hear the news talk about the latest lunacy, right? You come to church and somewhere out there in that, in, that, in that foyer, somebody's talking about the latest goofiness that's overtaken the land. You go to work and the people are saying, did you hear what happened so-and-so or where and where? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but there is a daily roll call of lunacy that parades, of evil that parades before us. Am I wrong? You notice that? We're inundated, it seems like, by media of all sorts. Media of all sorts advocating and honestly programming us to think unbiblically. Parents, grandparents, parents-to-be, let me tell you something. Screens are the things that's going to excise your children from you if you are not careful. If you're not vigilant, because I don't care what form it takes. I grew up watching Bugs Buddy, and the worst thing I had to worry about is you know, tearing apart firecrackers and making a bigger bomb, right? Losing a couple digits. That's what I had to worry about. Now, you'll have to worry about perversion being hailed as heroic. It's not going away. We ha we're inundated by media to accept as inevitable the new morality and the new sensitivity. Ah, oh, it's amazing. I think I mentioned this some time ago, that old bumper sticker that says, kill your television. Even today, even more than ever, is that needed. The idea of letting people be fed. They get programmed by the media. We gauge, honestly, if you sit back, we gauge the mores and the morals of our day compared to years gone by. And I don't know, but maybe you're like me and we lament that good has been labeled evil and evil has become celebrated and even preferred. That's happened. And it's not, and it's not in prospect, it's, it's reality. It's the way things are. That is what's going on, and you know this, I'm not telling you anything new. But in, in addition to it, we as believers typically are denigrated as anachronistic and panphobic, right? There's a phobic for everything, whether it's, it's math phobia or homophobia or letter phobia or whatever phobia you want, there's a phobic that will land right on your lap one day. It will land on your lap simply for being the people our families and our country once told us to become. Isn't that the worst thing sometimes of being old? Look, what, what happens is you, you get to a, be, to a place in a country, it seems like, where the people your country told you you should become are now the people that the country wants to get rid of. I asked a class, this relates to you, I suppose, somehow. I asked a class in Colorado, I was teaching a worldview class at a high school, and it was after the, the legalization of marijuana here in this state. And I said, how would you like to be the last person convicted of marijuana possession? It was illegal here, but not illegal here. How enraged would you become? Society has told you for decades, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Oh, now it's okay. But you're going to spend time in jail for having broken the law that we said was wrong the day before. How would you like that? And yet that seems to be how it, it's falling down to some of us, to, our, to the way that we think, to the way the Bible tells us to think. We've become the people that our nation and our families told us we should become, it seems. And now the nation is actively trying to silence us. Marginalizes. I, I sound really desperate, but I'm getting to some hope here. Because we also see the powers that be applying laws selectively, and nearing to the benefit of the agenda-driven and criminals. We are treated daily to the latest inversion of justice in cities, and we wonder how any kind of civilization can continue. Have you wondered that? How any kind of civilization can continue, and we are constantly barked at to accept a sliding scale of justice. 
that it should be the way it is. You go beyond and you hear na leaders and neighbors, and this is some of the things that, that really gets you after a while, doesn't it? I'm, I'm airing some grievances here, but we hear leaders and neighbors talking nonsense and enabling fantasies. We see fa family as labeled as utterly any combination of animate and inanimate objects you want it to be. We see building blocks of society turned inside out where having kids comes before marriage and marriage comes after living together. And anyone who advocates otherwise needs to be placed in a museum. We find fantasy codified everywhere. Teachers, government, and retail employees are being compelled to call people by whatever inane pronoun they choose. And gender being identified as fluid Men demanding to be referred to as she, her. Women demanding or expecting to be called he, him. And individuals telling us to refer to them as they, them. It's lunacy. It's fantasy. And this is, the way, this is what I really think about some of this stuff is, this is America, man. You can do whatever you want well, within reason, but I mean, you can, you can in, in, in your personal life, do what you want, but don't expect me to run along with it with you. And don't tell me that I have to look at, at Jack right there and say he's a girl. I'm serious. I mean, that's, that's, that's fantasy. And you all know this. I'm not telling you anything different, but I'm establishing a case here. So hold on to hold on here with me just for a second. You see Supreme Court justices that are confirmed who say that they can't define what a woman is because they're not a biologist. Confirmed. Not a single person would stand up. Well, some people probably did. Would stand up and say that is absolute maniacal lunatic fringe nonsense. That's crazy. And probably some people here think I'm crazy. And I would be doing much more if this microphone wasn't hot. I'd be pounding on things and everything else. But you'd have your eardrums burst if I did that. We see the absolute, complete, I put it here, abandonment of common sense where adolescent boys boiling over with hormones and I know it's a downer, a penchant for deceit, claim to be women so that they can go into a girl's locker room. Look. I was once a 12-year-old, 13, 14, 15-year-old boy, and if all I had to say was I was a girl to go inside a girl's locker room, sign me up. Uh, we've lost common sense. It's, it seems to be gone. We, nah, I gotta stop. You know what else we see that really ticks me off as the father of two girls? We see women being bullied into accepting men as competitors in their sports and then strong-armed into silence when those men stand on the center, center pedestal of victory. What has happened? I mean, it's just, and when did it happen? Who made these decisions? Does that, do you, you ever wonder the same thing? Who made these decisions, right? We look at all these things and the world seems like Felix. It seems so inevitable. It seems, again, like Felix to be invincible and beyond convincing. And, and so what do we do? We sit breathless before not only the rapidity of the changes, but the sweeping scale of them all. I told my son once, I said, you know, son, I think it was when the Target thing happened where they allowed women, men to use women's bathrooms. And this was a long time ago. I, don't, I haven't shopped at Target since. My wife does, but I don't. But here's the thing, I, I said, I think it keeps getting weirder and weirder and weirder because I think everybody's telling themselves, okay, well, this is the last stop. They won't go further than this. Certainly, they won't go further than this because somebody will say something. And then they go further. And nobody says anything, or, or at least very few seem to say something. Right? And then what happens? Well, that'll be it. They won't go farther than that. I mean... I mean, they, this was a punchline three years ago, the idea of calling somebody by a different pronoun. Now it's like standard policy. They won't go, and then they go farther. And we consider the new future being written before our eyes, and we fear for our children or for our grandchildren or for our great-grandchildren. I don't know. Do you feel that way? And we stand feeling the pessimism turn our living hope, basically, and once great optimism into an appendage of our past. 
replaced by a growing shadow of, of inevitability of the world's triumph and our own obsolescence. Paul before Felix is essentially us before the world. Both examiners, whether it be Felix or whether it be the world that we step out into when we leave this place, right? Both examiners are invincible, they're inevitable, they're insurmountable. And I think that's one of the most discouraging things. What happens is we tend to feel puny before their thrones, helpless in the face of overwhelming power, pessimistic in the reality of the blitzkrieg of change greeting us daily. You wake up tomorrow morning, you'll find some new weirdness. That's just the way it is. We are, Paul before Felix, I would even say this. We dare might even say that we are destined to lose. Ever told you about my first sermon? First one I ever preached in a church? It's 1989. I lived on Spain Bridge Road in Bozeman, Montana, which is an old farmhouse that probably sells for $200 million a day, but we rented it for $240 a month. And my pastor in Bozeman said, why don't you, why don't you give a sermon on the will of God on Wednesday night? Okay. I was 23 years old. Was I 23? I was 85, not 89. No, it was 89. It was 89. I was 23. Anyway, I'm, I'm going through all this stuff. And I began to get so queasy. I went up in the loft of the barn of the farm that we rented, and I practiced that thing. You ever practice speech? You ever feel stupid doing that? You ever feel goofy practicing that sort of stuff? I'm up in that barn, and I'm, I'm trying to do my best Billy Sunday, right? And I'm up there, and I'm, I'm, letting, I'm letting the straw bales have it. I mean, they're getting, they're getting double barrels of all this stuff. And then every now and then it would dawn on me, I've got to preach this before actual people. And I was like never so close, never so tempted to run away from anything in my life. Anything sounded better. I mean, from live organ donation to changing a light bulb on the top of the tower of the Sears building in Chicago without a rope, anything was preferable, I almost ran away. And then when something happened, it's like I realized that by being afraid, I guaranteed the outcome I feared most, looking like an idiot. I mean, that was what I was afraid of, and I probably still looked like an idiot, right? But I determined that I was gonna give everybody on that Wednesday night in that church both barrels of whatever God had given me and just let the chips fall where they may because otherwise I'm gonna look like an idiot because I'll get up there and I'll him and I'll I get nervous talking before you people you think I like this I mean it's not something I dream about hey I gotta go talk in front of people but that day was so terrifying to me the only thing I could think to do is just say you know what I'm not taking counsel of my fears, and if I look like an idiot, I'll look like an idiot, giving it my best shot. Probably did look like an idiot. Probably made a drooling cocker spaniel look intelligent, but, but at least I stopped being afraid. And you know what we are? We're afraid. We're all afraid. We're all simply afraid to tell people the truth. And that's the problem. Here's the thing. I think this is Paul before Felix. I think that's what we are. He, he, Paul has nothing to lose here. I mean, I mean, talking to Felix about the three things that we talked about, right? We'll talk about that in a second. Righteous, temperance, and judgment to come. That is not a recipe for being released. You know what Paul said? said I, I, I don't know. I'll ask him when I see him one day. But you know what I think Paul said? I got nothing to lose here. I'm dead either way. So I'll tell him the truth. He stopped being afraid, right? He knew that he was in checkmate. He knew he's not getting out of anything. He knew it couldn't get any worse, or maybe that it could, and that he might as well just go ahead and say what needs to be said. I'm not yelling, by the way. I don't know if it sounds that way or not. But that's the trouble with the resurrection. The trouble with the resurrection is it always leaves one shot in the chamber. It always gives us something to say that is true and effective. Because I think I can sit down and reason with anybody, hey, you know what, Paul Fisher's not a girl. Look at it. 
He's not a girl. I don't care what he says. And you know what? There's a whole lot of people in this world who will say, you know what? Paul Fisher is whatever Paul Fisher says he is. Paul Fisher's a salamander if he wants to be a salamander. And that's the way the world, and you know what? You think, I can talk sense into people, but you can't. Hey, you know what? That dude didn't win a girls track meet. That dude cheated. That's a guy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a brave person. I like being liked, right? I, I, one time I was the victim of a social media bully frenzy for something that I wrote. I don't like it. I hate it. I mean, it, it was bad. But how in the world do parents let their kids participate in sports against guys? Ah, because we're afraid. Ultimately. We are afraid of what people will say, what they will do. We're afraid of getting doxxed in whatever term there is anymore about exposing people. We'll get inundated with... We're afraid. And you know one of the reasons we're afraid? My goodness, I, I got to be careful because I'm not even half done. But here's the thing. One of the reasons we're so afraid is because we're disconnected. Do you have a living connection with people in this room or do you show up for an hour? Because you know what? We're afraid because we're alone. We feel like there's nobody who has our back. That's not what this is anyway. That's just a side point. But the fact of the matter is, how does that happen? And what do you have left to lose? At times, when this whole world starts to fall apart. And so here we go. I, I really have to get through this because I just identified the problem. But here's the thing. Look, at, look again in verse 25. And Paul reasoned of righteousness, right? These three things, temperance and judgment to come. And we said this last week, and I think it bears witnessing again here. Felix is, is, Paul before Felix is us before the world. Look, Paul, Paul couldn't threaten him. Paul couldn't challenge him. Paul couldn't get around him. Paul couldn't threaten to, to, to turn him into the authorities. Paul didn't play upon his sympathies. None of that would have worked. But there was something very interesting about talking about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come is that this man who needed nothing, that was filled with avarice and greed, began, as we said last week, he began to tremble, right? Look at verse 25. Felix trembled. I want you to know something. I'm not sure Paul saw him tremble. But he did. He did. And so this is, the, this is the thing I want to go through real quick. Because we're afraid we feel alone. We feel like we've got nothing to say. I'm telling you, at this stage of the game, when it comes to this, to this society, we, and I'm not, you got to hear me out, we got nothing to lose. Do we? I mean, I don't understand. I don't, I, anyway, I won't, I won't get into that. Sorry, I'm going to get in trouble for even saying that. But here we go. Here's the first thing Paul says that we need to remind the world. Paul before Felix, he says, we have no righteousness. We talked about this last week. I'm not going to belabor it. But Paul would write in Romans this simple statement that if one died for all, can you finish it? If one died for all, we conclude this. What? All were dead. If one died for all, then he said, we're all dead. Meaning not only did the resurrection of Christ expose our basic problem, but it showed us specifically, and remember this, we are all in trouble, right? All of us. Because we all have a, we're talking about righteousness here. Right? And I told, said last week that Paul's probably talking about the lack of righteousness that we all have. And maybe Felix, like a lot of friends that we might have, tells how good a person they are. Or surely that good person isn't in trouble because they've been so good and they've been so righteous. Well, no, 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 no. I don't care who it is, whatever name you pull out of history, that person has a righteousness deficit. I'm still not mad or angry. I keep realizing that sounds like I'm, angry. I'm not yelling at you. Right? Smiling. Right? But Felix realized, I think, in talking, right? In talking to Paul, I think what begins to dawn on Felix is that he cannot bribe his way into righteousness. Right? He can't order God to accept his goodness. Felix is a man used to ordering people to do all sorts of stuff. He's used to getting his way up the ladder and, and to kiss every ring and everything. He's used to getting to the places where he is by virtue of pandering to those who are actually in authority, but he knows that he cannot, he cannot order God to accept his righteousness, and he can't threaten God into submission. 
right? That's when you talk about righteousness, right? And so Felix knew instantly that before God, and here's the thing, before God, he didn't stand a chance. And again, we have to remember this, that Felix, when he heard that, did not break down and cry. He did not sob, he did not beg for mercy, but he knew, he knew it was true. And you know what happens? Sound effects. He trembles. You can imagine, this, Paul and him are probably not in a well-lit room. It's probably kind of dim. He's probably wearing pretty loose-fitting, low-flowing garments. I don't know that Paul saw him tremble. And to everything Paul saw, perhaps, this is not getting through. But he was. He was. Because Felix knew. And so here, here's the deal. The world seems so inevitable and invincible to us, and we can't threaten it. You know what? We probably can't vote our way out of this. I wish we could. I'm not saying don't vote. Vote. But I don't know we can vote our way out of this. We can't politic our way out of this. And we certainly can't talk our way out of the predicament that we've come into. So what do we do? Do we have a baby fit? Do we get angry at people? Do we get angry? Do we go extreme, bunker ourselves away? I think these days require us to break the glass off the resurrection and tell anyone who will listen to us about righteousness. See, I, I don't have the verse in front of me. You know it probably better than I do, but the weapons of our, war, of our warfare are not, car, are not carnal. You can't talk these people out of this. You can elect a thousand people far more conservative than any politician you could ever name. And you know what? They won't politic it out of people. Not going to happen. You know, the only thing we have, the thing that we have is the most effective thing of all, talking to people about righteousness. Look, there is real righteousness. And the real righteousness that came to this earth, we took and we put on a cross. But in the plan of God, you know what? That righteousness can be ours by faith. You don't have to worry about being good. You don't have to put your righteousness in a scale anymore. And you know what? Most of the people you would tell that to, <laughs> you know, oh. most of the people you would tell that to, they're not going to sob. They're not going to break down. They're not going to say, oh, you're right. Call me a he and not a she. but they will tremble because they know the truth. Because the truth is in the word of God. It's not in fanciful arguments. It's not in anger. There's a righteousness. And I'm not your judge. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible says you have fallen short. And I don't care what you are or what you believe. I don't care how weird I think you are or how normal I think you are. It's righteousness that you're lacking. favorite verse said it before says it all in 2nd Corinthians 5 21 for God hath made him to be sin who knew no sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that's righteousness secondly Paul says is this and I'm getting through these as fast as I can we will never stop searching and groping for satisfaction never 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 that's the idea of temperance, right? We talked about that last week. Temperance is the idea of self-control. And the reason people don't have self-control is because they're constantly trying to satisfy something. They buy too much. They order too much. They expend their time too much. They go from this hobby to this hobby to this thing to this person to this substance to this to this to this. And they're always trying to find satisfaction or joy or whatever it is that they lack. And they never find it. We've talked about this, right? And this is what Paul is saying to him. Look at you. You take bribes. You take women you take anything you want by whatever means you think is necessary and you think it's going to satisfy you well look at yourself are you satisfied and you know what Felix does Paul nails him I'm not even sure how old Felix is here but I'm certain he's not young and all his life he's taken what he thought would satisfy him all his life and we look around, <laughs> we look around in our world today, and despite the fact that, that Felix didn't cry out loud, notice that, that, that despite the fact that he didn't declare Paul free because Paul told him the truth, 
Notice that Felix didn't renounce his corruption when Paul told him, I know you're not satisfied, and I know you know you never can be satisfied, despite all of that. Didn't set Paul free, but Paul's words did do something that made him tremble. What do we tell a world? I mean, seriously, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be theoretical, I'm not trying to be ethereal, I'm trying to be solid and concrete here. What do we tell a world that has turned to lunacy in the search for personal satisfaction and happiness? And you know, that's what this is. You look at every single drag queen. You look at every single perversion that you can find out there. You look at every cause that you look at and say, that's not a cause, that's not a problem at all. What are you talking about? And at the bottom of it is this, temperance. It's the notion that people want to be part of something bigger than themselves and we have taken that from them, or society has. Being part of something bigger than yourself is being known of God and being, and being loved of God. It is being guided by God. It is salvation in Christ and every single person who goes about doing every little bit of weirdness that we have heard, that we will hear, and that we don't even think is possible yet, they're looking for satisfaction. They want some place to be. They want some people group. They want some recognition or designation that will finally make them happy to be alive. They will never find it. We can tell what we can do. We can tell everyone we know, and even those that we don't, and we have on occasion, and tell it in a nice, friendly, loving sort of way that their search for satisfaction in the darkness of personal avarice, even debauchery and stark raving foolishness ends in one place, hopelessness. That's the truth. I don't care how, how much you're telling me that you're finally satisfied that you found yourself or an accepting community outside of Jesus Christ and all the things that you're doing to satisfy you will fail you. We might not see it. And they might not fall down and beg God for mercy the minute we tell them. But I'll guarantee you one thing. They'll tremble because they know it's true. They know it's true. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All ye that are weary, come to me, and I will, out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. What is that? Satisfaction. Try any debauchery, any perversion you want. At some point, you'll just want more or something different. What can we do? Tell people that there's satisfaction in the gospel in Christ. And they will tremble to two ends, either salvation from the madness or hardening to the truth. But at least they were told the truth. Because the truth is in short supply in our society. There's a third thing that Paul mentions here, and that's this. He reasoned about judgment to come. He says, there's judgment coming, Felix. At what point, I wonder, did Paul decide telling this man of judgment was a good idea? Because again, it's not high on the list of things that people want to hear, especially people who, is, who are pretty much defined by very judgeable things. But Paul seems committed to the whole truth and tells this inevitable, invi invincible, and insurmountable man, your days of being untouchable are numbered. There is judgment coming, Felix. There's judgment looming on the horizon of your life. And you know what? He told him that. I don't see Felix begging for mercy. I don't see him repenting and turning to the cross. But he trembled. That there's judgment to come. Look. Paul before Felix is us before the world. What do, we, what do we do in the face of the ever-increasing death spiral the world has churned? Again, probably can't vote it out. Can't Fox News it out. Can't CNN it out. We can't angrily shout the world into submission. You realize that? You can't angrily shout the world into submission. It just wasn't, won't work. There's basically only one thing we can do. Or one of several we can tell those who know and many that don't, God is going to judge his creation. 
There is judgment coming. There is judgment to come. It reminds me, I think I've got this up here. I don't know, but I think it's this, that there is judgment coming. The writer of Hebrews said this, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. I don't know when it happens, but it happened. It happened to me. It'll happen to many of you out here. It will happen to some of you. You'll begin to realize that day, the day of meeting God is closer than you think. It's closer than it was. Right? You got to hear me out because I'm not saying Christians go through judgment, but I think Felix was in a position to know that his life was nearing probably a place where that could be a very, very real possibility no matter what. And the writer of Hebrews sums it up. There is a judgment to come, right? And that's the trouble with the resurrection. Here it is. If Jesus is alive, then his work in saving sinners is real and necessary. But, those for, the, but the, for those who refuse that offer, there remains only one thing. There remains a judgment. Again, last verse here is this. The writer of Hebrews says this. For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth about righteousness and about temperance. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. In the contemporary Bibles around this, this, this country, I guarantee you those verses are excised out, if not literally, then figuratively. That's all there is left. And see, this is the thing, the world probably won't cry for forgiveness the world most likely won't flee to the cross or beg for mercy. But I'll tell you one thing it will do before a God that will hold them accountable. It will tremble. And sometimes salvation comes from trembling. You know that? Sometimes salvation comes from trembling, from understanding that people will be accountable that God is going to judge people. And yet, let me just be clear about this and we'll close. We must not allow ourselves to joy in it. Did you hear that? We talk about judgment to come. We cannot let ourselves rejoice in it. We cannot allow ourselves the mentality of they'll get theirs. Does that make sense? You guys still with me? Don't do that. Don't be that person. We can glory in justice, not judgment. You tell people about the idea of judgment and you do it with this full knowledge that we were worthy of the same. All of us were worthy of the same. We tell the world of judgment to come because if there is no hope for righteous justice to come. Here's the thing, remember this. One of the reasons we need to talk about this a little bit more and have it brought up is for our benefit. Because I will say this, what will happen is if we lose sight of the fact that there is justice coming, we, are, we will be tempted to get angry and try to execute it ourselves. Trying to tell people about their... This is the promise of God. And, and, and again, I, I know I'm long, I'm really long considering when I started. But, but, but listen to me. God will handle the judgment to come. We have to be the instruments of grace and mercy that try and compel people away from it. And if we allow ourselves to be angry at people, and I understand that because I mean, there's times when I get that way too, but we have to check ourselves. And this is why we talk about it, to remind ourselves, God's, God's got this well in hand. God will deal with people as he said he will deal with people. Let us be gospel merchants of telling people you can avoid this judgment. You've got to tell them the truth. There's a judgment to come, but you can avoid it. You don't have to be there. And that's found in Christ. Lastly, we tell them of judgment. We tell them of judgment to come out of compassion and concern not out of vindictiveness. Because the trouble with the resurrection is that if Christ died for all, then all we were dead in trespasses and sins. And the only hope is the gospel. And the thing we can do is remind the world that is going headlong into lunacy 
that God is concerned with righteousness, but he's provided it. That they can search all their life for satisfaction and temperance, but God in the gospel is the only one who can provide it. And that there is a judgment to come, but that God has given his son so none of us have to experience it. That is what we can do. Father, this morning I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful you've given us... You've given us something in this world that is the only thing that will take this world and take the inevitability of it, the invincibility of it, and will make it tremble. Not before us, not before our anger, but before you and your righteousness. Father, may the world also see that you have provided everything we need to lift ourselves or to be lifted up out of the out of the mess that we're in. Father, help us to do something in this world, to speak such truth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.